News breaking today that one of Donald Trump's favorite yes men, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, plans to say no to Congress by refusing congressional demands for depositions of key State Department witnesses. That's one day after reports confirmed that U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo listened in on the call at the center of Donald Trump's impeachment inquiry, the one in which the U.S. president asked the leader of another country to investigate a political opponent. Mike Pompeo plunging his political future and the integrity of the U.S. State Department down the stonewalling path today. New York Times reports on the development this way, quote, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo threw up the first potential roadblock when he told lawmakers in a letter Tuesday morning that a demand from three House committees for American diplomats to sit for depositions this week amounted to an act of intimidation and did not allow enough time for the State Department to properly respond. It's important to remember, and more than a little ironic, that Mike Pompeo rose to some prominence in right-wing GOP circles, in part out of his questioning of Hillary Clinton in the Benghazi investigation. Of course, Hillary Clinton subjecting herself to questions from the body in which Pompeo once served, a move that Pompeo today describes as intimidation. Team Trump's capacity for hypocrisy is limitless, but Pompeo is also turning to stonewalling Congress after he chose to play dumb about the substance of the whistleblower complaint in a round of Sunday show interviews. Watch. The Wall Street Journal is reporting that President Trump pressed the president of Ukraine eight times to work with Rudy Giuliani to investigate Joe Biden's son. What do you know about those conversations? So you just gave me a report about a IC whistleblower campaign, not, none of which I've seen. Fact check. We've learned that Pompeo was on the call that the Wall Street Journal reported Donald Trump mentioned Ukraine eight times on. So it's unclear why he pretended not to know what Martha Raddatz was talking about. Watch more. I haven't had an, uh, a chance to actually read the whistleblower complaint yet. Uh, I, I, I read the first couple of paragraphs and and got busy today, uh, but I'll, I'll ultimately get a chance to see it. If I understand it right, it's from someone who had secondhand knowledge. All right, fact check. This whole secondhand knowledge deflection has been taken down by none other than the intelligence community's inspector general, a Trump appointee. He put out a statement just yesterday pushing back on that. Republican Senator Chuck Grassley also pushing back on secondhand knowledge attacks. And there's more bad tape for Pompeo, this defense of State Department officials. To the best of my knowledge, and from what I've seen so far, uh, each of the actions that were undertaken by State Department officials was entirely appropriate. We'll see. Because at least one of those officials has stepped down already. Ambassador Volker felt he could no longer be effective in that job. And just this afternoon, the chairman of the three House committees fired back at Pompeo's stonewalling attempt with an apparent threat. Quote, any effort to intimidate witnesses or prevent them from talking with Congress, including State Department employees, is illegal and will constitute evidence of obstruction of the impeachment inquiry. That is where we start today with some of our favorite reporters and friends. With us at the table, Eli Stokels, White House reporter for the Los Angeles Times. Gene Cummings, deputy bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal, has been breaking all sorts of news on the story. Chris Liu, former White House cabinet secretary and assistant to President Obama. He also served as deputy chief counsel of the House Oversight Committee during the Clinton impeachment. Our friend Donnie Deutsch is back. Plus, Frank Figluzzi, former assistant director for counterintelligence at the FBI is here. Frank, let me start with you. I've wanted to talk to you about all these developments for days, but talk to me about Mike Pompeo's exposure in this story as someone who was listening in on the phone call um, in the capacity as this country's Secretary of State, heard the American president mention eight times based on Gene's paper's great reporting, uh, Ukraine. Um, we know in a transcript released by this White House that the president asked for a favor, though, and we also have a lot of data points that show that military aid was held up before it was released. What do you see in Mike Pompeo today? Oh, so many things to talk about. So, <laughs> Nicole, one of the things we, this is how FBI agents re refer to what uh, Pompeo did with that ABC News clip that, that you played. It's called deception by omission. When you're interviewing a subject and you see the halting language, the hesitation, the nervous laughter, and then they just forget to tell you that actually, you know, although I haven't seen the, um, the IC, uh, IG report, I was in the room. So they just leave that out, and it's, it's evidence of consciousness of guilt. 
The other thing that I, I think it's important for viewers to understand is uh, Pompeo's come out and said, I'm not going to allow this to happen to my staff, my employees, this bullying and intimidation. Rest assured, he's not protecting these very seasoned, mature professionals. Rather, he's protecting the president from the truth, because the fear, of course, is that these employees are going to say, these, these foreign service officers are going to say the truth. Um, they didn't know what Rudy Giuliani was up to. They can't defend this. They, they, they were undermined in their professional capacity. It's going to be quite ugly. And back in my bureau career, when we had this happen with a corrupt public official, they came out publicly and accused the FBI of bullying or intimidation. We're not going to cooperate. At, in, at an early time in my career, I was dismayed, even angry. But then I realized I, I wanted them to keep doing it. I wanted them to publicly do this because it's going to blow up in the face of that corrupt official. And in this case, it is quite likely to become part of, a, of an article of impeachment that said, that's called obstruction. And it's all happening on Trump's watch. It's a cabinet official helping to obstruct. And I think it's going to be included in an article of, obstruction, of impeachment that's called generally obstruction. Frank Figluzzi, there's something that I thought of when I went back and watched the Pompeo tape knowing now what we know from from Gene's great reporting and from other reports about Pompeo's centrality in all this and the whistleblower um, uh, what they wrote about the State Department officials and I thought about Hope Hicks and that statement written aboard Air Force One where they were gonna lock down and lie about Don Jr's pretense for meeting with the Russians and Mark Corallo who's a, a longtime GOP sort of legal communications expert quit because he felt like he was witnessing some effort at obstruction in real time it would appear that Pompeo's body language was was a parallel in this crisis to Hope Hicks sort of um, uh, reassurances that nobody would find out lock it down and that's the very word that the whistleblower uses when he describes the classified computer system for literally locking down the notes. Do you, mean, do you think Pompeo thought these notes would never get out? Where, where I think Jamie reported by last Friday that eight times Donald Trump mentioned uh, investigating Biden with the leader of Ukraine. Yeah, you start. You, you started the question um, with with this. Where's the exposure for Pompeo? And I didn't really answer it on point, And now I get to. If he was part of that discussion about where to hide the transcript of this call, he is big time exposed, or as the president would say, bigly exposed, <laughs> because he's part of a conspiracy to obstruct and cover up. And he's got some explaining to do as to how, in God's name, that transcript of a congratulatory, congratulatory phone call somehow rises to the level of top secret compartmented and needs to go into that database. He's in a no-win situation here. Gene, you, um, your reporters, um, it, it, you guys have had some extraordinary reporting on this Pompeo part of the story, and I've referenced twice this report from last Friday by, by uh, reporter Rebecca Bauhaus, who wrote that in eight times in that conversation that you reported yesterday, Pompeo listened in on, Donald Trump mentioned to the Ukrainian president his desire or his wish or his uh, hope, his aspiration that the Bidens be investigated. Absolutely. He kept, we were told that he just kept coming back to it. And when the president of Ukraine would try to move to a different issue, for instance, buying more military equipment, the president would find his way back to, yeah, I hear you, but. And then he would again make a pitch that there was something wrong with what the Bidens had done and then the corruption around them needed to be investigated. And so when the transcript itself came out, the whole world could see. There it was. He came back to it over and over I need over a favor, again. though, was mm -hmm. the language. Mm -hmm. when it, when, Indeed. When they tried to turn back to the, the military installations. Um, I, I, I want to just hit pause on the significance of what Pompeo tried to do today, because there's a lot of conversation in Republican circles about whether Trump's um, sort of impervious political power with his base is transferable. I have always posited that it is not. And I don't think stonewalling Congress is going to work out as well for Mike Pompeo as it has for Donald Trump. 
Now, let's go back and look at Article 3 of the Nixon impeachment. I think which, I've got it. Which, I think which I've got dealt it. With Here we go. Of justice. And I know that Democrats want to focus on the Ukraine allegation, but if there's going to be a laundry list, it's in that obstruction of justice. It's not only on this investigation, it's on Mueller. Let's not forget, Wilbur Ross has been held in contempt of Congress on the census. So that is part of a, a broader pattern. And I think the more they hold this back, the worse it looks. And the crazy thing about the Pompeo thing, saying this is secondhand knowledge, well, I know someone who has firsthand knowledge. That's Mike Pompeo. And he will right. go before Congress to talk about what his firsthand knowledge is. Well, let me, to, to your first point, let me put up Article 3 of the Nixon impeachment contempt of Congress. Richard M. Nixon has failed without lawful cause or excuse to produce papers and things as directed by a duly authorized subpoenas issued by the committee of the, on the Judiciary of the House of Representatives and willfully disobeyed such subpoenas. That's exactly what it appears Pompeo is doing. And I also went back and watched Pompeo um, uh, with a lot of, um, I don't know what the right word is, uh, swagger is probably what he would use, so I don't want to use it. But um, very much relish the opportunity he had as a member of the House to question Hillary Clinton in the Benghazi hearings. The idea that, you know, it's good for the goose, not good for the gander. Why, why wouldn't he respect the body in which he once served? Well, there's a wonderful contrast. There's, a, there's Hillary Clinton testifying for 11 hours, taking every arrow that was thrown her way. And there's Mike Pompeo. I think he's in Italy right now, heading to Montenegro. With Sebastian Gorka. Like Sebastian Gorka. And he won't testify. And actually, what he's done instead is try to deflect this by starting this politically motivated uh, investigation of Hillary Clinton's emails. You know, and, and if you look at the obstruction that this administration has engaged in, be it the Mueller report, be it attempts to switch prosecutors at the top of um, SDMY, where the president felt imperiled, um, all the actions to intervene in the IRS. I mean, this is their playbook. It is, and it's worked for them politically to this point. One of the terms Frank mentioned was consciousness of guilt. Well, there's another term here in white collar crimes, and that is this illusion of in invincibility. Mm -hmm. And you see the president feels has such a vast illusion of invincibility and maybe it's not an illusion because at this point even though the system is designed to provide checks and balances they are flouting it at every opportunity and they have not paid a price they did not respond to the democratic subpoenas prior to the impeachment inquiry and it doesn't appear that they are going to now and so we've been talking to a lot of uh, democratic house members members of the intelligence committee about what are you going to do here and they're basically saying look the president Secretary Pompeo, these folks, Rudy Giuliani, if they stonewall us, if the president is out there trying to intimidate uh, the whistleblower and others in government who may have informed the whistleblower's complaint to prevent them from coming forward and giving more information, then they will leave Democrats no choice but to add this obstruction to the articles of impeachment. Ultimately, though, the question is, you know, for the president, he's going to sit back and say, so what? What's that going to do? I've got a Republican uh, Senate. I've got Bill Barr at the Justice Department. And as long as I've got those things, uh, I can act basically with impunity. I think, though, that what, what the president has done, or what he's finally been caught doing, because we don't know that he hasn't been doing this all along, is to really ensnare his top human shields in this. I mean, the whistleblower names Bill Barr and Rudy as the president's accomplices in this wrongdoing. We know from, from, from Gene's reporting that Mike Pompeo was on the call. So Mike Pompeo either thought there was nothing wrong with eight requests to investigate Hunter Biden, or he'd seen something worse. And I'm not sure. I think both make him an even more important mm -hmm. witness to be responsive to subpoenas. You know what's interesting? <clears throat> the thug culture. If, you, if, you probably, if we saw a tape of Bill Barr 10, 15 years ago, if we saw a tape of Mon Mike Pompeo 10, 15 years ago, different. It's amazing that transformation that happens in Trump's orbit. And to your point, to your point earlier, I do not think the invincibility translates down. Mm -hmm. two, two things that happened with two Republicans in the last two days. The fact that um, Mitch McConnell actually came out and said, no, we're going to have to move forward if the impeachment happens. Whereas there is wiggle room there, which was surprising. And then Chuck Grassley today. Um, I do think, and, and Jeff Flake has said, uh, that there are 35 Republicans, if they could do it anonymously, would vote. I do think as this thing goes along, and many Republicans see that at best he survives, but he's a loser in 2020, that they start to peel. And what I don't understand strategically, if I was working for any senator right now who is not going to be primary in the next two years, I could say you can be a historical figure. 
Stop thinking about what people Trump mm. think about Trump today. How is he going to be looked at in three years? It's a chance for somebody to be a hero and start to peel. Because I do think once one or two, three goes over the next few weeks, as this thing unfolds, I do think the dominoes could fall. You know, and I've been thinking about you as this has gone on, because I think to the degree that Trump's brand is sort of what he can fit on the top of a hat, um, it now reeks of political weakness, mm -hmm. can't win by himself, couldn't win by himself, needed foreign countries to help him, too weak politically, um, even weaker than he was three years ago when he seemed to surprise everyone with that victory. To, to, to be soliciting the help this time means he's politically weaker and corrupt. Corrupt as all get out. Those seem to cut right against his support. Particularly, the, you know, people almost accepted the corruption. Ah, he's a dealer, he's a wheeler. Yeah. When you see him now, he looks weak. He does not Sounds feel, weak. he does not feel, not just he has those droopy days, sometimes we don't have the teleprompter. He had always what he had, the one asset he's had that I always worry about the Democrats don't come forward with is strength. And right now, you're not seeing it. The camera doesn't lie. He's feeling weak. He's looking weak. For the first time, I look at this president and say he's really vulnerable. Well, I think what he's trying to do is figure out this environment and how to, how to respond to it and how to manage it. Because unlike in the Clinton administration, they had a plan and they, they put it in place and <clears throat> they put, created the war room and they separated it from the Oval Office so he could stay focused on governing. And those guys over there, they took all the arrows, they took all the media mm -hmm. requests and that sort of thing and they did all the spinning. Sometimes Trump's there's no spinning though. The problem here that they have is... Maybe there are no moves. I mean, their move is what I call the cap strategy. First, you confuse, you send Giuliani out, and you say 84 different things. Then you admit the wrongdoing, just like he's saying now, we're going to go to all the world leaders. And then you point at the other guys. But it doesn't seem to be sticking. That traditional strategy that moves everybody off, they don't have a lot of moves based on the black and white quality. Well, unlike Bill around. Clinton, Trump can't compartmentalize the same way where he can go about his day job and then vent, you know, at night. Trump is, is venting all the time, and the entire White House and West Wing are consumed by this. And, you know, you talk about weakness. People may see different things when they see the president, you know, on camera, on TV. But if you step back and look at what they're doing and what Attorney General Barr is doing, investigating the origins of the Mueller invest. I mean, they're heading into 2020, and the president is still consumed with what happened in an election when ultimately he won. But he's still consumed by the fact yeah, that it was yeah. investigated, that the results are questioned in any way. And the fact that that is directing the actions of the Justice Department at this point as he's heading into a re-elect just tells you all you need to know about paranoia. I mean, it's paranoia. all of the echoes of, of Nixon and Watergate yeah. are there. Frank, I want to bring you back in because I, I think Donnie alluded to this and I don't want this to escape attention. The inspector general for the intelligence community, the watchdog, who ended up in receipt of the whistleblower's um, seven-page report. And, and the idea that Pompeo couldn't read seven pages makes me really, really scared for America's diplomats all around the world. Because every cable, every, every cable, every diplomatic cable is longer than that. So you should all be scared. But the, 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 what the ICIG, intelligence community inspector general, did was he obliterated the most frequently um, trotted out talking point to defend Donald Trump from the whistleblower complaint, the idea that it was hearsay, the idea that it was secondhand. There is a protection for secondhand information from whistleblowers, but that's not all they have going for them. The, whistle, the IG went and investigated the allegations, and that's how he gave them the good housekeeping seal of approval that the whistleblower complaint was both credible because he went out and interviewed other witnesses, other people maybe working on the 18-acre White House complex, and urgent. So just talk about that process. Well, be because this is a non-traditional thing for a, a, an inspector general to do, they generally work quietly behind the scenes and let their investigations <laughs> speak for themselves. I'm, I'm inferring from this a couple of things. One is, he feels strongly about what he's got and what this whistleblower provided and what his investigation of the credibility of the allegation shows. Number two, he's battling for the future whistleblowers. He's saying, I've got your back. If you need to come forward, and maybe others have, I'm going to have your back and push back. And then lastly, I actually see this, this action empowering um, members of the media, members of Congress, to also push back. I've seen, a, I've seen almost unprecedented pushback across the networks over the last, uh, say, three days 
on, on any, any spokesperson or representative of the White House who's trying to just call, just, just trying to put forth BS. I, I see them getting called on it. And if the IG inspe is of, the, of the intelligence community is leading that charge, amen to that. And, and then I guess the last point on this whistleblower, um, Chris, is that much of what he put out in the seven pages, which is impossible, yeah. it's an incredible read, impossible not to read it in one sitting, um, has been corroborated. As, as Jean said, the White House released the transcripts that corroborated everything that the whistleblower wrote about the call. Congress was already investigating the holding up of the aid that was released in the middle of the night, really, once this, this was yeah. all in motion. And we're almost getting beyond the point where attacking the whistleblower and Donald Trump's on a pretty uh, focused effort to out this whistleblower, which is terrifying. Um, all of his, his tip sheet has all been investigated yeah. and confirmed. No, I mean, this is the problem. If you look at the Republican playbook, the first thing was to say this was hearsay. Of course, now we have the president corroborating it himself. They've now tried to attack political bias of this whistleblower. And, you know, notwithstanding the fact that, we you know, we take whistleblowers, you know, how we come, whether it's Deep Throat, whether it's Linda Tripp, whistleblowers sometimes have political agenda. But you look at the facts of what they're alleging. And so the playbook of attacking the messenger has clearly failed, in part because of the seriousness of this allegations. If you look at you know, what Donnie just said about them not having another move left, part of it is if you go back to Watergate, the quote-unquote smoking gun tape was kind of the final straw before Nixon had to resign. These guys put out the smoking gun tape because they thought it exonerated them. And so now they're trying to walk it back, but it's the president's own words in that transcript and his follow-up co uh, collaboration corroboration that make this so hard to, uh, to message right now. All right, we're going to button it up uh, on, on this Pompeo there, but, but I just have to leave everybody with Pompeo's words about why not to release notes from that call. Don't do it. Don't do it. Here's what Pompeo said. We don't really, oh, here, let's listen. We don't release transcripts very often. It's the, it's the rare case. Those are private conversations between world leaders, and it wouldn't be appropriate to do so, except in, in the most extreme circumstances. There's, 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 no, there's no evidence that that would be appropriate here at this point. If you're watching, that man said that, knowing that Donald Trump asked eight times that the Ukrainian leader investigate the Bidens. When we come back, Donald, go ahead. Do you want to say something? What's his job again? <laughs> That's our Secretary of State. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.